You know, he did not make one move without checking with God first. That is very interesting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. And this is Quick Study Weekend Edition. We are excited to read through the Bible. As we do, we land in 2 Samuel today. This is interesting. Corey's going to tell us what she's doing. Corey? I'm going to be focusing in on the city of Beth Shean because it shows up a little bit in our scripture. All right, so. very good. Beth Shean, what did you do today? Today I'm going to be talking about names in 2 Samuel chapter 2. That'll be very good. Very interesting. Okay, Ryan, there's only one thing to do, and what is that today? <laughs> well, today engineer Dr. Burgess is here to tell us about technology which he and his team developed which was actually inspired by brilliant designs in nature. Exactly, brilliant designs in nature. I look forward to that, I've seen this, it's very good. And David is, we're waiting for him to rise, so get your Bible guide and your Bible, let's go. In the very last chapter of the book of 1 Samuel, we are told that the Philistines hung the bodies of Saul and his sons on the walls of Beth Shean after, you know, sending their heads different places throughout the territory and sending their armor different places throughout their territory. And that was just really an ancient victory parade, uh, you know, showing ultimate triumph over their enemies by displaying the king's body. Today, let's focus in on that city of Beth Shean. The ancient city of Beth Shean plays a gruesome role in 1 Samuel chapter 31, the record of the murder and display of King Saul and his sons. During their final battle with the Philistines, Saul and sons fall. Their bodies are beheaded and stripped so that the royal armor can be displayed in pagan temples. As for their bodies, they are taken to Beth Shean and hung in victory on the city's defensive walls. Today, Beth Shan, which means House of Quiet, has been archaeologically excavated. Much of these excavations have focused on the Roman city that lies at the base of biblical Beth Shan, but some conclusions about the older city have still been arrived at. Beth Shan was built on the paths of two important roads, a north-south and an east-west. The biblical city shows evidence of Egyptian control during the time period of the judges of Israel, but there has been no evidence to date of a Philistine takeover during the days of Saul. A plausible explanation to this is that the Bible describes surrounding citizens picking up and fleeing from before the Philistinian army. A situation like this would leave no discernible archaeological evidence of takeover. And with the Philistines being finally defeated and ousted from Israel by King David less than a generation later, not much evidence should be expected. Unfortunately, the walls of ancient Beth Shean have yet to be found. This may be due to the lack of excavations of the biblical city on the top of the tell, or possibly due to the massive Roman building that occurred at the site. Regardless, thousands of years after the fact, the Mount of Beth Shean still stands dominating the landscape, silently holding its ancient witness. So our extremely gruesome example of ancient warfare from the very last chapter of 1 Samuel involved this city of Beth Shean with the displaying of their enemies' bodies on um, the, the city walls. This is not the most gruesome that ancient warfare got. It, it you know, there are some really horrible stories from history, uh, but it does make sense. You know, Saul and his sons, it was the king and uh, for all intents and purposes, the crown princes of the nation of Israel. And, and so they wanted to show their ultimate domination and, and the fact that they had conquered Israel so thoroughly, even though they hadn't really, it was just one battle. Uh, but this triumph was a major one. Uh, and, you know, when we get into 2 Samuel, we see David getting the news of this. We hear of uh, some very brave Israelite men who were loyal to Saul and his sons who went and they actually fought in their own battle to get the bodies of Saul and his sons back 
back and they were successful from that. So that would have been seen as getting some honor back from the enemy. Uh, you know, this ancient culture was one that had tremendous feelings of honor and shame. That was the way their society was set up is, you know, getting honor and, and trying to push away shame. So reclaiming the bodies of Saul and his son and being able to give them proper burials would have been huge in the eyes of ancient Israelites. David did not quickly become king, though the Lord anointed him years earlier. The people, they were confused. And because many in Israel did not see or understand the kingdom of Israel as God's kingdom, they made many mistakes. They felt the nation belonged to a man. But God carefully dictated David's moves so that the people would know and understand that this was his kingdom. One thing David often did was inquire of the Lord before he made any move. This was virtually and vitally important in the functioning as king of Israel. Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20 is clear about the role of kings in the nation of Israel. David made his moves slowly, but surely. The enemy of our soul runs out of space and time when we serve the Lord. Second Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It happened after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. David said, Where shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. So David went up there and his two wives also, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail, the widow of Nabal the Carmelite. And David brought up the men who were with him, every man with his household. So they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, The men of Jabesh-Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. So David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh-Gilead and said to them, You are blessed of the Lord. For you have shown this kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and have buried him. And now, may the Lord show kindness and truth to you. I also will repay you this kindness, because you have done this thing. Now, therefore, let your hands be strengthened and be valiant. For your master Saul is dead, and also the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. But Abner the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. And he made him king over Gilead, over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was forty years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. Only the house of Judah followed David. At the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. You know, there, there seems to be an ongoing theme in all of these past five days that we've talked about, and that is this, that David didn't make a move without consulting God first. And really, that's perfect. That's what we need to do. Before we do anything, we need to pray and say, Lord, is this something of you? The things that happen to us, there are many things that happen to us during the day. And we need to make sure that they are from God or not from God. We need to test the Lord or the Lord needs to test us. And we need to pass the test by praying and saying, Lord, help me to respond to you today. 
When you get up in the morning and pray and read your Bible, just say, Lord, help me to respond to you today. Very important. I can't imagine getting up in the morning, not praying and asking the Lord for that. That'd be a challenge. And I would uh, suggest that all of us do the same. Get your Bible guide out and your Bible and turn to today's passage as we study this today. You can use the addresses at the bottom of the screen to write for your Bible guide if you haven't, or you can go to www.biblediscoverytv.com, biblediscoverytv.com, and click on donate, make a donation in any amount that helps us, thank you so much. And say, I want to get a Bible guide, we'll send it to you, or it'll take you to the PDF page that has the Bible guide on it, very important. As we focus on this today, we look at the ways of truth. The ways of truth are interesting. Waiting for David to rise. What am I talking about? Waiting for David to rise. This is interesting. We read 2 Samuel 1 to 3. 2 Samuel. Looking at 2 Samuel 2, 1 to 11. How does David handle the success that he is going to have? Father, I pray today in Jesus' name, you would help us to learn how to handle the success that you will give us after we've been tested and after things have been in place, help us to learn how to handle the success. In Jesus' name, we're going to read from the scripture today. Talk to us. Amen. The scripture is interesting. Here is what it says. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, it says, It happened after this that David inquired of the Lord. Inquired of the Lord. He's checking with God, saying, Shall I go up to any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, go up. David said, this is beautiful, where shall I go up? And he said to him, God said to him, to Hebron. So David went up there and his two wives also, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David brought up the men who were with him every man with his household, so they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. That is amazing. David did not make a move, not one move, without first consulting the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, God. Beloved, we must never move anything or anyone without praying. Don't do it, because that's gonna get you in a bad situation. Don't do anything without seriously praying. I moved many times in my life, and I want to tell you, that's something that we learned how to do quickly. And I'm not saying that every move was of God, but I'm saying that we tried to make everything we did of God. And it's important that we do that today, that we pray and allow God to move. Now, with that in mind, we go to the next passage of Scripture, which says this in 2 Samuel 2, verses 4 to 7. Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. That's the tribe of Israel, king over the house of Judah. All right, that's interesting. And they told David, saying, the men of Jabesh-Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. So David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh-Gilead, and he said to them, you are blessed of the Lord, for you have shown this kindness to your Lord Saul and have buried him. And now may the Lord show his kindness and truth to you. I also will repay you this kindness because you have done this thing. Now, therefore, let your hands be strengthened and be valiant, for your master Saul is dead. And also the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. That's amazing. You see, David rewarded the people of Jabesh Gilead for recovering the bodies of Saul and his son. We must allow God to move on our behalf and not force it. Do you remember Jabesh Gilead? They were Saul's first success. When the men came, said, I'm going to take all of you guys out. Nahash said, I'm going to take all you guys. I'm going to take your right eyes out. They said, give us seven days. And they went to Israel and said, they're going to take us out. And Saul said, who is going to take you out? I am going to get them together. I'm going to go. And Saul rescued them. So Jabesh Gilead was an interesting place. 
David knew that. He understood that, beloved. We must realize that God moves in very good ways. And every person, every employee in our business, every person who's under our supervision, every person who is, who is somebody we buy from, these are people who are men and women of God. We need to understand that. Now then, let's go to 2 Samuel 2, verses 8 to 11. But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him to Mahanaim. And he made him king over Gilead, over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, over Benjamin, over the Isra all of Israel. And Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. Wait a minute, David's king. Well, no, hold on a minute. Back to the scripture. And he reigned two years. Only the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron only over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Okay, this is interesting. David allowed Ishbosheth to lead Israel, even though he was anointed king. We must not allow anyone to force us into a fight. David knew, he understood, he realized that this could be a very bloody fight. And he chose, I'm not going to fight, not going to do that. I'm going to let the Lord deal with this. God is going to handle this. You know, there are many things in our life that we must let the Lord handle. There are many times when we could fight and probably win when we don't need to because it'll end in a bad way. We need to do the perfect will of God, not the permissible will of God. The perfect will of God is what we aim for, not the permissible will of God. Beloved, we need to make sure that everything we do and all of the things that we pray, that we, that we do are prayed about and thought through. This is very important. Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, help us to hear you. Thank you, Lord, in your wonderful name. And we said together, amen. They did what they thought would make King David happy, but he wasn't happy. King David had a different reaction than they expected, and it cost them their lives. We'll talk about that and more next time on Quick Study Television. Right now, here's Ryan. Well, you know, I'm really excited because Professor of Mechanical Engineering, Dr. Stuart Burgess is here to talk about one of my very favorite topics. That is bio-inspired designs. What is that? Well, I'll let Dr. Burgess explain. You and your team have developed technology which has been inspired by brilliant designs in nature. Now, can you share with us some, example, some examples of these bio-inspired designs you've been working on and also explain why this is problematic for evolution? Yeah, bio-inspired design is a very big topic in engineering. Lots of academics, lots of engineers are pursuing this area and I've been working in this area now for nearly 20 years. One uh, example I've produced is a bio-inspired knee joint for use on robots. Uh, so that joint I spoke about earlier on, in the knee joint, I've produced uh, designs inspired by the human knee joint for robots. We've also produced bio-inspired micro-air vehicles based on dragonflies and dragonfly uh, flight. We've also produced um, a human hand inspired by some of the mechanisms in fish jaws. 
And we've also looked at bird-inspired microwear vehicles as well. So we've looked at quite a number um, of examples producing bio-inspired design. Now this is a huge challenge to the theory of evolution because according to evolution, we should see bad design in the natural world. And if, if you read books by Richard Dawkins and others, they will fully admit that according to evolution, the natural world should have a lot of bad design. And in fact, the natural world should look worse designed than engineering. The reason is that engineers are not limited to step-by-step -step change. Engineers can put lots of things together all at once to produce irreducible mechanisms. Engineers can over-design as much as they like. But evolution can't do that, because evolution should only give you enough just for survival and uh, things that are step by step. And evolutionists have, have admitted this, that it's a very limited process, which is why people like Richard Dawkins have been predicting bad design. But in a way, I think they've dug a very big hole for themselves, because in recent years, engineers in particular, but also other scientists, have been discovering that nature always has superior design. That is what is coming out in the current academic journals. If you read journals like Journal of Bioinspired Design, the Journal of Design in Nature, time after time after time, the conclusion is design in nature is superior to engineering, which is the opposite of what the evolutionists have been saying. But it is exactly what the creationists would predict because in the book of Job, in Job 30, chapter 37, it says, uh, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God, the works of him who is perfect in knowledge. So the Bible is telling us that the creator of the world is perfect in knowledge. And therefore we would expect nature to be superior to man-made engineering, which is exactly what we find and by the way, as an engineer, I would be mad if I didn't copy the designs of one who is perfect in knowledge. So for me personally, this has been just a tremendous encouragement to my faith that working in my lab on bio-inspired design that I've been working myself, it has really confirmed uh, my faith uh, in creation because it is exactly what creation would predict. You know, I love this topic of bio-inspired designs because it's so fascinating and it's also a great testimony to the creator God of the Bible. Maybe in the future we can actually devote some significant time to this topic. In the meantime, remember to check out Dr. Burgess's material. We have to take time and study that and it's really important when we talk about this kind of thing, the, the origins of design in biology, that's important. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't think of that because they don't see it that way. But really, we need to think that through and understand that God is telling us he's designed this stuff. We need to understand that. Also, we're on the internet. And so we need to tell people that on the internet, you have creation.com, you have icr.com, and you have answers in Genesis and all of that. And you can go to those websites. If you have a homeschooler, if you're a homeschooler and you do homeschooling, you could go to some of the websites and figure out what you want to do for that because that's really important. I know that there are some books uh, of homeschooling that have good creation science, and but I would also tell you that it would be good for you to go look at the websites and discover them. Very, very interesting. Thank you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Very good work. Uh, okay, tell us what we did this month. Yes, so uh, our offer for this month is called Quick Study Unplugged Spiritual Experiences, and in it we talk about the various spiritual experiences, not only that we read about in the Bible, but also that people have been experiencing and even still experience today. So we try to explain those and understand them from a biblical perspective. So if you would like to get a hold of your copy of this DVD, then it's again, it's called Quick Study Unplugged Spiritual Experiences, and it's for a suggested donation of $20 or more. Look forward to that. It's actually uh, going to be something that we are going more to do more of, the roundtable discussion. Mm -hmm. And I like those roundtable discussions. <laughs> Me They're too. Very good. It's not a really a roundtable. It's kind of That's a, true. a it's square a, table. It is a like, square table. Anyway, but it's a roundtable idea. But the thought process is a roundtable. <laughs> round. Yes. We all have equal opportunities to speak and debate. <laughs> and yes, we're not we sitting do. in our normal spots. That's right. That's we're true. Not. Yeah. We'll spice they, it up I'm, a bit. I'm, we do spice know, it up. I'm on the far end, so I'm demoted. That's so, for sure. You know, 
right. They want me to not talk Not so the much. demotion, but you're on the far <laughs> end, that's for sure. Anyway, anyway, uh, what did you do? Well, you know what? We zip through the Bible often. We go through a lot of names and we read, you know, the son of this father and the son of that father. Mm -hmm. And we can go through them and we can miss details that can add a lot to the passages that we're reading. And I find that in today's reading of 2 Samuel chapter 2, we hear mention of, of um, uh, Joab, which we've read about mm -hmm. a lot in the past. But we hear twice in this passage that he is the son of Zeruiah. And, and we read that in verse 12, but also as we get down to verse 16, not verse 16, verse 18, we hear again, now the three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Azahel. And Azahel was as fleet of foot as a wild gazelle. That's pretty fast. That's pretty fast. That's a pretty it's fast pretty runner. Pretty springy, I pretty think. Pretty <laughs> springy. But you would say, well, Janice, why are you bringing these three up? Well, Usually we're talking about the son of a man, mm -hmm. but Zeruiah is not a man. Zeruiah is actually the sister of David. And so this, these three men are the nephews of David and they are in David's army. So mm -hmm. it's just, it just adds another element to this accounting of history that these three nephews of David uh, the, the sons of his sister are in his army and the one is noted especially for being a very fast runner. And if you haven't read this portion today, take a moment and read through it because it's fascinating what happens afterwards as he chases after Abner mm -hmm. and Abner turns around because uh, this young fellow is chasing after him. And uh, so you will also find in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 16, you will see a genealogy and uh, you will see David's brothers mentioned, as well as his sisters, and then the sons of Zeruiah. So you'll see them listed again as we get into First Chronicles. So mm. just an added element. It really of, does add um, that human element back in, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. you get reading sure. these names, and there's so many, and you could tend to forget that, oh, right, I heard about Zeruiah a little bit ago. And now when you hit First Chronicles, you'll remember when you see Zeruiah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I remember that. Zeruiah. Zeruiah. That's interesting. You know, mm -hmm. what would you call her for a short name? I don't know. Zara? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Very interesting because uh, it's his sister and that's, you know, his sons mm -hmm. and his, and the, they also say that uh, these were men who were not, um, who didn't agree with everything that Saul was doing who were with him as well. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very interesting. Well, there you have it. Uh, that, that's amazing. Thank he you so much. He had two sisters. Yes. He had another sister named Abigail. And you'll find that in that same listing that I was mentioning in First Chronicles. So right. this is very interesting. These are real people, real families. They are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The First Chronicles, of course, that, that's the genealogies. And uh, a lot of people say, well, I don't like reading the Bible because of the genealogies. But the genealogies tell us details that mm -hmm. are very important. That's right. And so remember that every word of the Bible is very important. God has spoken to us and we learn so much from it.